Okay, so we're going to pick up uh, with Beowulf about to jump into Grendel's mother's lair. Um, you know, he's he's traveled there um, with King Rothgar. He has just received the devastatingly dangerous sword Runting from Unferth, uh, you know, the greatest warrior in Denmark whose name literally relates to unfaith or untruth. And now he's about to jump into the water. Um, you know, we're just about at chapter 22. This just seemed like a better place to end than, than um, you know, it, it, well, whatever. Uh, Beowulf tells Unferth, no, this is all summary. Let my famous old sword stay in your hands. I will shape glory with runting or death will hurry me from this earth. Um, carrying the sword runting, Beowulf goes to the lake where the monster's mother has her underwater lair. Then fully armed, he makes a heroic dive into the depths of this watery hell. Um, the only thing that, you know, is sort of skipped here that I think is worth mentioning is that um, Beowulf turns to Hrothgar before he jumps in. And he says, hey, if I die, take care of my men and send my armor back to my king, Higlak in Geatland. Uh, again, sort of the same sort of thing he said he said before. Um, remember, though, that we have really established that this is sort of a hell image. I mean, we got the cold coming out and the icicles everywhere, which is a pagan hell. We've got the fire, which is a Christian hell. We've got the depths of the lake uh, glowing hot. Uh, we, we talked originally about how Grendel made his home in a hell, not hell, but earth. The swamp is sort of hell on earth. Um, and Herod is heaven on earth. And so we have this sort of heaven hell thing going on. And, and now Beowulf is headed down there to deal with Grendel's mother um, in her own world, sort of like the champion. So here we go. Uh, chapter 22, The Monster's Mother. He leaped into the lake, would not wait for anyone's answer. The heaving water covered him over. For hours, he sank through the waves. Hold up. Wait, what? For hours, he sank through the waves? What? Uh, remember, he has unlimited swimming abilities, and apparently pressure doesn't hurt him, because water pressure sinking for hours would actually crush you teeny tiny. But let's turn off our science brains. This is not a science story. This is a story told by people from before science was a thing. Um... So he sinks for hours. Can you imagine standing up there at the top of the pool and, you know, like he jumps in and it's been hours and he hasn't come back? You know, I'd be a little nervous. Uh, at last he saw the mud of the bottom and all at once the greedy she-wolf who'd ruled those waters for half a hundred years discovered him, saw that a creature from above had come to explore the bottom of her wet world. She welcomed him in her claws, clutched at him savagely but could not harm him, tried to work her fingers through the tight ring-woven mail on his breast but tore and scratched in vain. Then she carried him, armor and sword and all, to her home. He struggled to free his weapon and failed. The fight brought other monsters swimming to see her catch, a host of sea beasts who beat at his mail shirt, stabbing with tusks and teeth as they followed along. Pause. All right, so he gets down there, and uh, Grendel's mom's an interesting character. She's never adequately described either. Um... She's described by two kennings. You get basically just two kennings to describe Grendel's mom. Number one is this one, a she-wolf. Again, more evidence that uh, Grendel is sort of a werewolf creature because his mother's described as a, as a she-wolf. The other kenning that describes her is a sea witch. Um, so she's a she-wolf and a sea witch, um, which to me gives me this, this hideous idea that, you know, and maybe it's just because I've been impacted by Disney and other films, that she should really look like bottom half should be like Ursula, the sea witch from, from uh, The Little Mermaid, all squid and tentacles, and the top half is werewolf, except female werewolf with like female body parts. Like that's, that's terrifying. She smells like squid and wet dog um you know like that's well anyway but she attacks him right and if he wasn't wearing his armor he would have died so he was smart to wear armor down here it's also said that she's ruled these waters for half a hundred years that's 50 years that's exactly how long hrothgar has ruled the danes so there's this nice balance this um carefully structured harmony in the story hell on earth heaven or heaven on earth hell on earth each ruled for 50 years. We also get her intimate connection with nature again. Not only is this a water lair, uh, but she's got sea beasts at her command that come and attack Beowulf with, with tusks and teeth. So there's probably like sharks and walruses and a narwhal and a jellyfish and God knows what kind of sea creatures are coming to attack Beowulf. Uh, but this is essentially the, the water level from Mario. You know, like he's down there and he's got to, he's got to survive. Um, let's see. Um, he struggled to free his weapon and failed. The fight brought other monsters swimming to see her catch. A host of sea beasts who beat his mail shirt, stabbing with tusks and teeth as they followed along. Then he realized suddenly that she'd brought him into someone's battle hall. And there the water's heat could not hurt him, 
nor anything in the lake attack him through the building's high arching roof. A brilliant light burned all around him, the lake itself like a fiery flame. Okay, so now this this symmetry is complete. She takes him down to the bottom of this lake, and there's a battle hall down there. Not a mead hall, a battle hall. And flames burst up everywhere, and she drags him in. There's probably like a little bubble of air in there. This is a death match. Grendel's mom versus Beowulf in the battle hall. You know, like, that bubble of air down there, that's got to be like, God, oh, all the dead bodies. You know, no, no thanks. Uh, but there he is. He's trapped inside this, you know, opposite of Herat down here in this hell. And there's fire everywhere. Um, you know, so this is the intense moment. This is a cage match, essentially, between, between the two of them. Then he saw the mighty water witch and swung his sword, his ring-marked blade, straight at her head. The iron sang its fierce song. Great little, little metaphor there. Um, sang Beowulf's strength, but her guest discovered that no sword could slice her evil skin, that hunting could not hurt her, was useless now when he needed it. All right, so he takes a sword, whang, and like wings it off her head, and it just bounces off because it turns out that Grendel's mom has the same enchantment that Grendel does. Maybe it's genetic, uh, you know, and, and swords can't hurt her. So this great sword that he brought from Unferth is completely useless. Uh, let's see. They wrestled. She ripped and tore and clawed at him, bit holes in his helmet, and that too failed him. For the first time in years of being worn to war, it would earn no glory. It was the last time anyone would wear it. But Beowulf longed only for fame, leaped back into battle. He tossed his sword aside, angry. The steel-edged blade lay where he dropped it. If weapons were useless, he'd use his hands, the strength in his fingers. So fame comes to the men who mean to win it and care about nothing else. He raised his arms and seized her by the shoulder. Anger doubled his strength. He threw her to the floor. She fell, Grendel's fierce mother, and the Geat's proud prince was ready to leap on her. But she rose at once and repaid him with her clutching claws, wildly tearing at him. He was weary, that best and strongest of soldiers. His feet stumbled, and in an instant she had him down, held helpless. Squatting with her weight on his stomach, she drew a dagger, brown with dried blood, and prepared... I'm assuming it's to stab him with it, but, you know, like, let's find out. To avenge her only son. Uh... But he was stretched on his back, and her stabbing blade was blunted by the woven mail he wore on his chest. Hammered links held, the point could not touch him. Um, I'm going to pause there for a second. So this is a pretty intense battle, right? Like, much more intense than the battle with Grendel. Grendel's mom is a much better fighter. Beowulf's armed. He's got armor and weapons, um, you know, and, and yet she's still holding her own with him in a way that Grendel isn't. Grendel was afraid. Grendel's mom is not afraid. The power of courage. Also, I think it's interesting that Grendel's mom, you know, she's a female character, and she she's a strong female character, and she's justified in her actions to some extent. Grendel was just a murderer. Grendel's mom is trying to avenge her son. I think we can all sympathize with that to some extent, and maybe that leads lends her some strength, some power, some ability. But she starts tearing at Beowulf, and... Um, you know, he decides to to fight her and he doubles his strength with anger. What's that, the strength of 60 men? And throws her on the ground. But then, like, he's tired, I guess, from holding his breath for hours. And um, she flips him and she's squatting on his stomach with this rusty dagger, about to give him, I don't know, bloody rusty dagger? Um, tetanus and AIDS at the same time. And, uh, you know, it, it looks pretty bad. Now, I often ask myself, you know, wait, wait a second. This, um, this story says that Grendel is a descendant of Cain. Cain is the first murderer who stabbed his brother Abel with a, with a knife. Um, is this knife the knife? Is this a knife that the first murder ever happened with? That, you know, like is an heirloom of Grendel's family? Like, whoa, that's a disturbing thought. But whatever, Grendel's mom is going to kill him. Um, she takes the, the dagger brown with dried blood and is going to avenge her only son. But his armor, which he wisely wore, protects him. He'd have traveled to the bottom of this earth, etched those sun, and died there if that shining woven metal had not helped. And holy God, who sent him victory, gave judgment for truth and right, ruler of the heavens, once Beowulf was back on his feet and fighting. That's right, Beowulf's losing. He's gone all the way down to hell, and he's fighting Grendel's mother, and he is going to die. So what does he need? Let's go back to our lit terms. What happens when a hero is out of their league and struggling? They need divine intervention. And here it says he's going to get help from holy God. So here it comes. Watch this. Chapter 23. 
Then he saw hanging on the wall a heavy sword, hammered by giants, strong and blessed with their magic, the best of all weapons, but so massive that no ordinary man could lift its carved and decorated length. He drew it from its scabbard, broke the chain on its hilt, and then Savage, now angry and desperate, lifted it high over his head and struck with all the strength he had left. Pause. Wait, what? Beowulf stands up, looks up at the wall, and there's a giant sword up there. It, the Kenning is giant made. It's a giant made sword. Um, and he just rips it off and, and he's going to swing it and kill Grendel's mom with it. Like, isn't this a little too easy? Why is this giant sword hanging on the wall of her home? Why is it that in every superhero movie, the bad guy, like, keeps the thing that can kill them, like, hanging on the wall of their house? It goes back 1,500 years. Um you know, and what does this giant sword look like? Well, it turns out that there's a couple of interpretations of the translation here. Clearly, um, Burton Raphael, the translator here, has gone with the giant sword. The sword is like the, the length of a school bus, and you need the strength of, I don't know, 30 men to lift it. And, you know, it was made by giants, which is a connection directly to Old Norse mythology and the giants that Thor had to fight and stuff like that. Um, that's one interpretation. But if you recall the Wanderer, um, in The Wanderer, the poet says, these giant built structures stand empty of life. And it used to be a widely held belief that um, the Romans were giants because they, they built these huge structures with boulders up higher than anybody could ever lift them. And people started to sort of uh, mythologize that and think that these people must have been larger than life, better than, better than humans, so giant made. Um, and so this giant made sword could literally mean a giant sword, like our translator here has gone with, or it could mean a sword built by the Romans, like an ancient sword that was better than any other sword um, that could have been. So you can interpret that in a couple of different ways, and it's worth worth thinking about. Well, anyway, he drew it from its scabbard, broke the chain on its hilt, and then Savage, now angry and desperate, lifted it high over his head and struck with all the strength he had left, caught her in the neck and cut it through, broke bones and all. Her body fell to the floor, lifeless. The sword was wet with her blood. And Beowulf rejoiced at the sight, the brilliant light shone suddenly as though burning in that hall, as bright as heaven's own candle lit the sky. He looked at her home. Actually, I'm going to pause there again. If you need more evidence that this, this sword is divine intervention, here it is. He kills Grendel's mom with it one hit. Grendel's mom's like, ah! falls down to the ground, like cut halfway through. And uh, all of a sudden, like, light shines, like sunlight and harps play or whatever. It's like, oh, you killed Grendel's mom. Um... It's brilliant light shone suddenly as though burning in that hall and as bright as heaven's own candle. That's the sun, right? Heaven's own candle uh, lit the sky. He looked at her home, then following along the wall, went walking, his hands tight on the sword, his heart still angry. He was hunting another dead monster and took his weapon with him for final revenge against Grendel's vicious attacks. His nighttime raids over and over coming to Herat when Hrothgar's men slept, killing them in their beds, eating some on the spot, 15 or more, and running to his loathsome moor with another such sick meal waiting in his pouch. But Beowulf repaid him for those visits, found him lying dead in his corner, armless, exactly as that fierce fighter had sent him out from Herat, then struck off his head with a single swift blow. The body jerked for the last time, then lay still. All right, so Beowulf is not happy just killing Grendel's mom. You ever, you ever, how many of y'all play sports? Um, you ever finish a game and you're like, it's not over. You just want the game to keep going. That's Beowulf. It was too easy and he needs he needs to kill something else. So he holds onto his sword and he goes over and he finds Grendel's corpse. And he's like, <laughs> and chops his head off with one, with one chop. So now he's mutilating a body, I guess. Um, the body jerked for the last time and then lay still. The wise old warriors, oh, now we have a shift. We had the same thing. The, the construction in this, in this story is, is remarkably um, consistent. If you recall when we were fighting Grendel, um, we had this moment where we shifted out and we saw all the Danes in their beds, like cowering in their covers. This happens here too. We're fighting Grendel's mom. Now we're going to have like a camera shift. We're going to zoom all the way up to the top of the lake and we're going to see the Danes looking down at the lake. Um, so it's sort of like a camera angle or scene shift. The, um, the wise old warriors who surrounded Hrothgar, like him staring into the monster's lake, saw the waves surging and blood spurting through. They spoke about Beowulf, all the gray beards, whispered together and said that hope was gone, that the hero had lost fame and his life at once and would never return to the living, come back as triumphant as he had left. Almost all agreed that Grendel's mighty mother, the she-wolf, had killed him. The sun slid over past noon, went further down. The Danes gave up. 
left the lake and went home, Rothgar with them. The Geats stayed, sat sadly watching, imagining their, they saw their lord, but not believing they would ever see him again. Okay, so now we have this little interesting passage. We're going to go back down to the bottom of the lake in a second. But we get up there, and all the Danes are watching, like, blood starts coming up. The water's boiling. It's been hours, and the Danes are like, It's been hours. There's no way he's alive. If we stay here until night, she'll come up and kill us all. Let's leave. Right, and so they all leave. And... You know, Beowulf's now 13 guys who are who are still his followers. They decide to stay. They don't really believe that he's still alive, but they stay. This, of course, is probably a Christian allegory, you know, like uh, doubting Jesus in the resurrection, you know, or, or, or something like that. Um, you know, but whatever. Back to it. Uh, Beowulf just chopped Grendel's head off with the, the giant made sword that he found down there. Then the sword melted, blood soaked, dripping down like water, disappeared like ice when the world's eternal lord loosens invisible fetters, chains, and unwinds icicles and frost as only he can. He who rules time and seasons, he who is truly God. So the sword cuts Grendel's head off, but Grendel's blood, remember, is so hot and boiling that it made the entire lake boil. Its blood gets all over the sword blade and just melts it. Of course, this is probably where uh, whoever wrote the, the movie Aliens got the idea to have the aliens have acid blood. I mean, it, it makes sense. But the blood melts this blade, and the simile or the metaphor that we have here is that the, the blade melts like an icicle in the summer. Now, connecting the blade with, with ice is interesting because... The giants in Norse mythology are ice giants, and this is a giant-made sword. So is this some connection with that? Um, maybe, maybe. I think it's an interesting speculation. Um, the monster's hall was full of rich treasures, but all that Beowulf took was Grendel's head and the hilt of the giant's jeweled sword. The rest of that ring-marked blade had dissolved in Grendel's steaming blood, boiling even after his death. And then, when the battle's only survivor, sorry, and then the battle's only survivor swam up and away from those silent corpses. Water, the water was calm and clean. The whole huge lake peaceful once the demons who lived in it were dead. Then that noble protector of all seamen swam to land, rejoicing in the heavy... That's a horrible line, by the way. Uh, swam to yeah, land, rejoicing in the heavy burdens he was bringing with him. He and all his glorious band of geats thanked God that their leader had come back unharmed. They left the lake together. The Geats carried Beowulf's helmet and his mail shirt behind them. The water slowly thickened as the monster's blood came seeping up. They walked quickly, happily across roads all of them remembered, left the lake and the cliffs alongside it. Brave men staggering under the weight of Grendel's skull, too heavy for fewer than four of them to handle. Two on each side of the spear jammed through it. Pause. I know this. Wait. Beowulf swam up all this way, holding the skull that takes four people to carry with a spear jam through it. By the way, if you stuck a spear through the skull, wouldn't the spear burst into flames because of the hot blood? Sorry, it's the story. Um, yet proud of their ugly load and determined that the Danes seated in Herat should see it. Soon, 14 Geats arrived at the hall, bold and warlike, and with Beowulf, their lord and leader, they walked on the Mead Hall green. Then the Geats' brave prince entered Herat, covered with glory from the daring battles he had fought. He sought Hrothgar to salute him and show Grendel's head. He carried that terrible trophy by the hair, brought it straight to where the Danes sat, drinking the queen among them. It was a weird and wonderful sight, and the warriors stared. So this is the first time we see Beowulf lose his cool a little bit. He comes up, and Hrothgar's gone. Um, you know, and all the Danes are gone. They, they didn't have faith in him. They didn't believe that he would be successful against Grendel's mother. And so he takes the head, and he walks. He goes back to Herat, and he, he busts through the door while they're having dinner. Um, and he carries this this head of a severed monster and, like, throws it on the floor in front of them. And, um, you know, the queen is among them. It's rude to, like, bring a severed head in front of a queen. Um, but he does it and uh, proves that he's killed Grendel's mother and, and thereby completely finished Grendel forever. Um, you know, and this is an is intense moment for him. Uh, and then the story is going to summarize some chapters for you here in a second. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just read the, the summarized chapters before, and then, then we can talk about what just happened before I close out. Um, Beowulf hands the head of Grendel and the hilt of the magic sword over to Hrothgar. Beowulf explains to Hrothgar, quote, Hrunting, unfirst noble weapon could do nothing. In amazement, Hrothgar stares at the face 
of what has been Denmark's evil and the hilt of the magic sword. Hrothgar throws another huge celebration in Beowulf's honor and once again shares his treasure with Beowulf and boasts of how Beowulf's name will live on for all eternity. A glorious celebration ensues and Beowulf rests for the evening. Beowulf grew restless, longing to return to Geatland. With Hrothgar's approval, Beowulf returns to Geatland, but not before accepting Hrunting, the sword offered to him by Unferth. So he gives Hrunting back to Unferth and Unferth's like, no, keep it. Um, Beowulf graciously accepts Hrunting. Beowulf then returns to his lord Higlak and delivers dozens of new gifts from Hrothgar to Higlak and Higd, Higlak's noble queen, and their son Herdred. In return, Higlak gave Beowulf 7,000 hides of land, houses, ground, buildings, and fields. Um, so that's good. Uh, we'll, we'll just, that, that summary, I'll, I'll give you more on that summary when I open up the next lecture, uh, because I think a lot of the end of that is useful to, to what's going on there. Um, so let's talk about this story and, and how it's interpreted. Um, you know, the battle with Grendel's mother. If you go to college and you study Beowulf, you're going to run into, um, you know, sort of an interpretation that a lot of people come at this from, which is sort of a feminist interpretation. I mean, Grendel's mom's an interesting character. She's a strong female character in a an epic about men. Um, as such, she's also a better fighter than her son was. I mean, she definitely pushes Beowulf closer to the edge. He needs divine intervention to beat her. And, um, you know, she's, she's more respectable and likable than Grendel as well. Uh, so, you know, she's an interesting character and a lot of studies have been done on her. And one of the, I think, strange and, and kind of bizarre interpretations of this is that um you know you can you can read this scene between beowulf and grendel's mom as some sort of like a weird sexual encounter scene between uh, beowulf and grendel's mom which you know if you watch the terrible animated movie of beowulf they definitely like go all in on that interpretation i think the interpretation is garbage um you know and I'll, I'll explain why but i would be remiss if i didn't teach it to you so that you could see it and i mean there is innuendo and i think burton raphael our translator here uh takes it a bit farther than than you would necessarily want it to go uh but you know let's let's look at this and look at some of the passages that that people can look at he leaped into the lake would not wait for anyone's answer the heaving water covered him over uh for hours he sank through the darkness all at once, a greedy she-wolf who'd ruled those waters for half a hundred years discovered him and saw that a creature from above had come to explore the bottom of her wet world. People are like, hmm. Uh, right. And then, you know, they have this fight and she's clawing and scratching at him and he's trying to hit her with a sword, but it's useless. So then he has to grapple with her with his hands and he throws her to the ground and then she squats on his chest. And, you know, like there's definitely something some people think like some tension here. Um, she's taken him into her home. You know, and then uh, he he's got to fight her and uh, he ends up pulling this giant sword off the wall. And people are like, oh, I bet I know what that giant sword symbolizes. You know, and then, of course, he kills her with it like one chop and that sword is wet with her blood and he's rejoicing at the sight. And then what happens? Well, the, the sword melts away and disappears. Um you know, and then he's victorious and uh, he swims to the surface. The, the what did it call him, unfortunately? Um, the protector of all seamen. Yeah, seamen, like sailors. Come on, people. Um, you know, but it's weird. The sword melted, blood soaked, dripping down like water, disappearing. I mean, like, and so people are like, hey, maybe this is some sort of a metaphor of a, a encounter between Beowulf and Grendel's mom. And it's, it's, tempting i think to to read it that way and you're certainly going to run into that interpretation if you study it um in in your western world literature class in um in school uh and and i don't buy it i don't buy it for a second first off this is written by a priest uh to have some weird sexual encounter scene in the middle of it uh messes with the tone and messes with the interpretation i think there's a, a much more convincing interpretation of what's going on here um another one that that you'll often see is that people look at this and they're like hey this is very much like uh when jesus dies and comes back and that the you know like theoretically if beowulf is like an anglo-saxon jesus figure you know, he's got to go down, he's got to face um, Grendel's mother or whatever, like she's a demon in hell. And he goes down there because when, when Jesus died, theoretically went into hell. There was this harrowing of hell. He released a bunch of the Jewish patriarchs. Um, 
and and you know took them um, to heaven with him and this could be a scene of that but also you have this lack of faith where Rothgar and his guys are like I don't believe that he's coming back and leave and uh, the Geats don't even really believe that he's coming back but they wait there and there's 13 of them and that's very close to the number of um, disciples you know in the Bible and so uh, there's another connection to be made there maybe this is a harrowing of hell scene um, and I can see that to some extent uh, but I think you know like we need to talk about something now that that um, I think makes a whole lot of sense uh, when when you start seeing the pattern of how Beowulf is put together. So I'm going to switch screens here for a second, um, and we'll talk about the trifold thematic pattern in Beowulf. Um, I think I better move this screen over a little bit so I'm not over my own writing. Um, there we go. So. Uh, the trifold thematic pattern. Beowulf sort of has three major conflicts, and we've dealt with two of them now. And I think we've seen enough that we can sort of understand and interpret the pattern a little bit. Uh, you know, first we had the battle with Grendel, which very clearly is a battle of fear versus courage. Um, you know, the fight occurs in Herat, which means heart. Uh, it's on land. Beowulf is a champion. He goes in unarmed uh, to prove some ideas that, like, a weapon and armor don't make you courageous, that alcohol doesn't make you courageous, that the only thing that can actually defeat fear is courage that comes from inside you, not external forces. You know, and we have, we have a series of... Um, thematic things that happen one after another and reinforce this idea. First, we have the Danes and Grendel. Um, you know, Grendel shows up and he's terrifying. He represents fear. Uh, he scares all the Danes. They flee from him. Uh, they cannot defeat him because none of them have the courage to face him unarmed the way Beowulf does. Then um, Beowulf arrives in Denmark and the Watchman shows up and the Watchman tries to cause Beowulf to be afraid. He shakes a spear at his face. He talks in a very intimidating way. Beowulf is unafraid and his fear makes the watchman afraid then we go to uh, king rothgar's hall where we meet unferth the greatest warrior in denmark and he tries to make beowulf look little and be afraid and beowulf is unafraid and unferth backs down and then we have another repetition of this scene where grendel shows up and um rips up one of beowulf's guys theoretically going to make beowulf afraid beowulf's not afraid he faces him unarmed the only way that he can defeat grendel and disarms him rips his arm off and sends him home to die and the idea here is that grendel is a personification of fear um his greatest strength is fear but his greatest weakness is fear as well and this you know like this is the point where we we start to see how the author has structured this thing in repeated ways to underscore a central idea and the central idea is sort of allegorical i, I would say here that um Beowulf is an instruction manual for how to be a successful Anglo-Saxon warrior. Um, you know, and, and the truth is that one of the first lessons that you need to learn is how to be courageous. Uh, because if you're, if you're motivated by fear and if you feel like courage is causing other people to be afraid, you're destined for an unsuccessful life, right? And so if this is an instruction manual on how to be an Anglo-Saxon warrior, they're trying to teach you how to be courageous. And this is a young man's struggle. This is something that, that, every young person deals with how to overcome fear and become yourself and not worry what other people think and you know like we deal with it on a small scale every day uh, but think about it for yourself like um every day we make decisions and, and what percentage of the decisions that we make are based on fear fear of the consequences you know like do you come to class and and watch this because you want to watch it or are you afraid of what happens if you don't get a good grade are you afraid of not getting into college um you know like when you when you were going to school uh did you choose your clothing for example because you really wanted to represent yourself and who you are or you're afraid of the dress code or you're afraid of what other people will say or afraid of judgments i mean think about what percentage of your daily choices are based on fear uh, versus choices that you really want to make for you. Uh, and I think this is an interesting question. And, you know, as people get older, they get less and less concerned what other people think. And, and more and more frequently, they, they behave um, how they want to and are, are, I guess, confident in themselves. And I think this fear versus courage is sort of a young person struggle, a young man struggle, if you will. Uh, but then we move on to stage two, which is despair and revenge, you know, and this is, this is a something that especially a adult person is going to have to deal with. Uh, what, how, how do you deal with the loss of a loved one, the loss of a best friend? To us in modern America, it doesn't happen all that often. Uh, but if you're an Anglo-Saxon and the average life expectancy is 
uh, 27 or 26 years old, um, this is going to happen all the time. And so how do you deal with despair? Well, the old Anglo-Saxons had this way of dealing with it, which was the blood feud. You get revenge when somebody kills um, you know, a, a family member. And so despair and revenge seems to be the theme here. In fact, uh, we had the Danes and Grendel fighting. Grendel was killing the Danes. The Danes were in a state of despair. They needed revenge. So they called Beowulf. Beowulf comes and kills Grendel, um, you know, and, and the Danes are avenged. But Grendel, uh, you know, slowly sinks down to the bottom of his lake. Meanwhile, we have a celebration where we tell this story about Finn and the Danes uh, and how Finn betrayed... Thanks, Darcy, for that loud noise. Uh, Finn betrayed the Danes, and and they deserved revenge, and they burn him in his in his great hall, um, you know, and they get their revenge. And so there's a story of despair and revenge. And then, of course, Grendel's mom sees her dead son and is like, I need to get revenge. And she goes and kills Asher, uh, putting Hrothgar and the Danes back into despair, and they need revenge. This is an unending cycle. I think the story says that both monsters and... Um, Danes had had engaged in this fight and they both lost. Nobody won. Uh, and so Beowulf goes down to face Grendel's mom and and get revenge um, and end the despair of, of the Geats. And that seems pretty straightforward. This battle, you know, talking about progressions, uh, the first battle happens in land. The second battle happens underwater. Um, you know, so we go from land to water. Uh, who knows what the third progression is going to be here. We can all sort of speculate. I know I've read it a hundred times. Uh, but this one sort of takes place in this battle hall, which is hell as opposed to heaven. Uh, Beowulf is now the challenger instead of the champion. He he goes down fully armed and ready to fight. Um, you know, so there's that. But what what does this battle with Grendel's mom symbolize? What is it all on a symbolic level? Well, if Grendel represents fear, and that's the emotion that's associated with him. Hold on, I gotta let this dog out. She's starting to go crazy. So, you know, if if Grendel represents fear, uh, and that's the the emotion that's associated with him, you look at Grendel's mom, I would argue that she represents despair. Um, you know, like she's a mother who lost a son. Uh, Every every time you see her uh, arrive, it's, it's sorrow had come to Denmark. We have these words sorrow and despair associated with her all the time. She's also associated uh, throughout most of literature. When you have water, uh, it represents one of two things, either a cleansing, you know, sort of rebirth image, which this clearly isn't, or sorrow and despair because of tears. And so she lives in this lake. Um, you know, Beowulf goes to face her and he jumps into the lake and he sinks down, down, down into the depths of... I don't know, despair. Uh, so I think it's really, you know, like that sort of depressing depths metaphor. Um, he gets down there and he fights her and she ends up, um, she ends up like squatting on his chest, trying to stab at his heart with a rusty dagger. I would say that's a personification of how it feels to be in despair when you lose a loved one. Um, so if Grendel's mom is a physical representation of despair, uh, then how does Beowulf defeat her? Well, he goes down there, and we can start looking at this as an allegory and see a lot of the elements of this story as, as allegorical. He goes down there, and he tries to face her uh, with the sword that he got from Unferth, and the sword maybe represents friendship, you know, like it's, it's a sword that a friend gave him. Well, can you defeat your sorrow over the loss of a loved one because a friend is trying to help you out of it? No, you can't, right? Like, uh, if this is the struggle of how to overcome the death of a loved one, you know, revenge, you take the sword and he tries to kill kill Grendel's mom with it and fails. So also, you know, Unferth's name literally re relates to unfaith. And I think that's going to be important as we get through this. Hold that idea. Uh, so Unferth's sword is useless. Uh, he's supposed to be protected by this helmet that he was given, another symbol of friendship, from Rothgar. And the helmet crumbles and falls apart and does not protect him the way that it's supposed to. And so that is sort of a failure as well. And so friendship is not getting him through um, this despair. And it looks like he's going to be destroyed. So what does he need? Divine intervention. He looks up on the wall and there's this giant sword. I still have a sword here. Um, now the sword is, is way more enormous than this, right? Uh, but the sword is hanging on the wall and, and the sword, you know, it feels like a plot hole that she's got this weapon that can kill her hanging on the wall of her house. But let's, let's think about this in a metaphorical way. Uh, what if the sword isn't a literal sword, okay? Beowulf grabs this giant made sword off the wall and it's the one thing that can kill Grendel's mom and it's hanging out on the wall of her house and, and he murders her with it. Um, but 
anybody who reads a lot of old uh, European stories, uh, there's there's a classic symbol um, that you can see, especially during the Crusades. It was very a very powerful symbol, and that symbol is a sword. Um, a sword, and I, I'll see if I can hold it far enough back. A sword um, was in two parts. Uh, the Crusader sword, especially, it, it has the hilt and it has the blade. The hilt has these things coming off the side, and these are what's called as the cross guard. Uh, if you ever look at a Crusader sword, it's designed to look like a Christian cross. And so the, the traditional symbol of the sword was that the hilt represented the Bible uh, and that the blade represented faith. And so these guys would go on crusade and they they chop up a bunch of uh you know, people who they considered to be heathens or, or people who didn't believe correctly, and they'd be cutting them down with, with their faith. And the hilt of the sword would often have Bible verses written on it. Uh, you know, and so the sword was a very religious artifact, and it represented the faith of the person um, who was going off to a holy war um, or holy battle. And so you had this church slash Bible hilt and this faith blade well if the blade of the sword represents faith and he pulls this giant sword off the wall and cuts down grendel's mom with it um you know this whole thing becomes an allegory maybe the story is that and maybe it's not a plot hole you know like what is the one thing that can help you defeat despair it's not friendship it's not your own courage his courage was useless his strength was useless all of his abilities were no good to him the only thing that helped him win that battle was divine intervention and if divine intervention is symbolized as a sword which is on the wall and represents faith then um you know the reason maybe the sword is so big is because beowulf's faith is so big um you know he can just he can just cut her down with a cut down to spare and and so you know if it's a divine intervention then it's, it's not a plot hole because what is the author saying? He's saying that no matter where you are, there's a weapon at hand and that weapon is faith. And all you need to do is reach out and grab it. And that weapon will help you overcome any monster. Uh, it, the monsters are, are manifestations of negative emotions. Um, and I think that, that it gets even more powerful if you start really looking at it. Let's go back to Anglo-Saxon uh, mythology. Like, how do you get to heaven? How do you get to As or Asgard or Valhalla? You die with a sword in your hand. I think the author is doing something profoundly complex and interesting here. Uh, Beowulf fought Grendel without a weapon in his hand because it said very clearly that a weapon, a physical sword, uh, cannot help you against fear. Only your own courage can do that. But courage is not enough to get you over despair. What you need is faith. And we're going to symbolize faith as a sword. Well, this this is sort of this works on on multiple levels now by the way i think it's funny um this is a pause and then a side that i just i think is amusing and may may help you understand a little bit more do you ever watch like or, or look at old crusader uh movies or, or stories that are, are written about old knights one of the things that they always say as they're dying is like give me my sword and then they like grab onto their sword and die well that goes back to this idea that you have to die with a sword in your hand to get to get to Valhalla. Um, but old crusaders, if you look at old crusaders' graves, they're always dead holding onto their cross-shaped sword um, as, as they're put into a grave. And this is an interesting overlay of two religions, right? Like on one hand, uh, they're holding a sword when they die. So they're like, just in case. But they also shape the sword to look like a cross so that they're also doing homage to to Jesus. And they put all this this Christian imagery on the sword. And I think it, it fits well together here because what the author is saying is, um, there is a sword that will get you into heaven. Um, that sword's not a physical sword. That sword is a metaphorical sword, and the sword represents your faith. If you have faith, you always have a weapon that can get you through the hardest times, um, that can defeat the toughest demons, if you will, the demons that you face metaphorically in your life. Um, and if you continue to believe, that sword is also going to always be in your hand, whether you're, you're down in the depths of hell or despair or wherever. And if you wield it, it will help you get to Valhalla, right? Like it all connects and overlays beautifully. So... Beowulf gets this magic sword and, and kills Grendel's mom with it, but then he goes and he beheads Grendel, which I think is interesting because, you know, like also this, this relationship between Grendel and his mom, I think is interesting. You know, if Grendel represents fear um, and Grendel's mom represents despair, what is the mother of fear? Well, what are you really afraid of? You're afraid of the despair of losing someone, of loss. So she really is on some level, like the mother, we're, we're associating the two emotions together. And, um, you know, courage is not going to defeat despair. If you want to defeat despair, you need faith. And it turns out that when you defeat despair with your faith, your faith also immediately defeats 
fear. Uh, so you can disarm fear with your own courage, but you can't behead it unless you have faith, right? Like, so it all, it all comes together in this interesting way. But why does the blade, you know, vanish? Why does it melt in Grendel's blood? That's, that's another interesting question. Um, and I think the best answer I have to that is that the next thing that Beowulf does is he swims up to the surface of the lake after having defeated these monsters with, with the sword representative, I guess, of faith. And, um, uh, he gets to uh, King Hrothgar's lair and gives King Hrothgar the hilt of the sword. You can hand somebody, remember what did the hilt of the sword represent? The church or the Bible and the blade represented faith. You can give somebody a Bible. You can, you can invite somebody to church, but you cannot give them faith. Faith by definition is belief in something that cannot be proven. Um, you know, if, if you could prove it, it would be fact. It wouldn't be faith. And so the blade has to disappear, especially when it's not needed anymore. Um, you know, you use faith in a moment of crisis to get you through difficult situations. You can't maintain that level of belief openly all the time. Uh, and so he hands the hilt of the sword to King Rothgar. It's actually interesting when Rothgar um, looks at the hilt. And these, this is chapters that are just breezed over in this version. When Hrothgar looks at the hilt, it turns out that the hilt has writing on it, and Hrothgar reads the writing. The writing is about a flood that killed the giants, and about the parting of the waters, and he whose name is written on the sword. You know, like, and, and it says, you know, Bible allusions in Genesis, and, and uh, Jesus, and, you know, like, all those sorts of things, if you, if you start interpreting it. And so it really does represent this, this sort of idea of faith. And at the end of that, uh, in the passage, uh, the the author says, uh, so Beowulf was able to rid Denmark of two fiends, um, fear and despair, and everybody was able to sleep peacefully in their beds, knowing that the monsters could trouble them no more. And this idea that Beowulf, you know, Rothgar was faithless. He was like Unferth. He didn't believe that Beowulf would be successful. And Beowulf had to come up and show um, Grendel's dead head to give um, Rothgar faith. This idea that um, Beowulf sort of brought faith. This whole thing becomes a metaphor. Maybe Beowulf is a metaphor. It's a, it's a story that's told in a very Anglo-Saxon way about a warrior um, facing and, and killing these monsters. But maybe, you know, Beowulf himself represents a, a monk, a Christian priest, a missionary who comes and metaphorically defeats fear and despair by Christianizing a people. Uh, you know, like, so there's a lot of ways to look at this passage and a lot of ways that make a whole lot more sense than some sort of weird sexual encounter between Beowulf and Grendel's mom. Um, and I, I totally buy this interpretation. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop for the day and I'm going to, hint at number three in the trifold thematic pattern. Um, we haven't yet learned what the theme is. It hasn't been clearly introduced. It will be here, and I will talk about it in a second. But what if I told you that the third monster in question, we fought Grendel, we fought Grendel's mom, the last monster is a dragon. So if Beowulf is going to fight a dragon, take a second, this is going to be your assignment for today, a reaction assignment. Um, Look at the pattern. What kind of elements of the pattern can you see? Um, try and think to yourself, you know, like, what is the theme? What is the third theme? Uh, if, if the theme is going to be, wh where does the fight take place? You know, uh, so if fear versus courage is a young person's struggle and despair and revenge is an, a mature person's struggle, then what, what theme is an old person's struggle? That's a question you got to answer. If the first fight took place on land and the second place takes place under water, uh, what element is the third place fight going to take place in if it's a dragon? Um, you know, so let's let's do some predictions based on the, the themes that we've seen and how the story has gone on. And give me your predictions for what's coming. Uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll give you a grade for that. Thanks.